Amen. Today's talk is entitled The Fire of Elijah, How to Reignite Your Faith. How many of you want your faith reignited or ignited even more? Okay, I want that as well. And uh, is Dennis here today? Did I see Dennis? No, Dennis not here. Oh, I saw Dennis. Anyway, many years ago, uh, we had a church in Moreland's uh, trading estate in the match factory over there. And some of you were there with us. And whilst we were there, we were doing pretty much what we do here. We do the Sunday morning service. We do a Friday night youth group. We do a Tuesday evening Bible study. And we had been studying revivals of the past and I've been preaching on revivals and things like that. And it got to the point where we're like, well, we've studied revivals quite a lot. Now we need to start seeking God for revival. And so what we decided to do was to hold prayer meetings every morning in my garage. And back then, my garage was not nicely insulated like it is now. It was cold and it was chilly. And we had like a little blow heater in there just to keep us warm. And so we advertised it to the whole church. We're going to now start seeking God for revival because the Bible says that when we draw close to God, God will draw close to us. And so on that initial kind of early morning, I think it was from seven o'clock to eight o'clock prayer every day, Monday to Friday, on that initial kind of Monday morning, we had a handful of people turn out. But then as the weeks went by and as the months rolled by, that kind of dropped off until there were about two people left, including myself. And one of those people was uh, Jean's uh, husband, Dave Sharp. And he would drive all the way over from Quedgley every day at seven o'clock in the morning to come and join me for prayer in, in the garage in the morning to pray for revival. And another one was an Irish guy called Roy Andrews. And if you ever met David or Roy, you know, these are the two of the loveliest guys. And uh, they would drive over every single morning to the garage, seven o'clock in the morning, before I had to go off to work and pray for a revival. We'd pray for a whole hour. And for the first week we prayed and nothing happened. The second, next month we prayed, nothing happened. Six months went by, we were praying for revival, morning after morning after morning and nothing was happening. A year went by, we were praying and seeking God for a revival, nothing happened. And then it happened that about two years later, after getting together morning after morning after morning, and believe you me, I'm not one of these super spiritual guys that says like waking up at half past six in the morning for a seven o'clock prayer meeting is the most exciting thing in my life. Okay, it was boring sometimes. And, and getting together to pray and seek God for the same topic day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month, year after year, God send revival, God send, I'm not, no sign of it, God send revival, send revival, send revival, send revival. It got monotonous, it got repetitive, but we just kept on keeping on. And then one day, one Sunday morning, we're in Moreland's Trading Estate. We're meeting together. We're worshiping God like any other Sunday. It's no different to how it was today. And all of a sudden, there came this rumbling from within the congregation. And people just began to shout out in praise to God. Amen. And you couldn't stop them. And it was one after another, after another, after another, after another. Just people screaming at the top of their lungs. People shouting. And the reason I mentioned Dennis is because Dennis was there. And all you could hear over the top of everybody's screams and everybody's shouting was, Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! And this didn't go on for 10 minutes or half an hour, 45. This went on for a few hours of people just shouting and praising God and falling down on the floor, sobbing and weeping under the weight of their sin. It was so intense, it was so powerful, it was so unexpected that I couldn't even stand up and preach that day. And you know me, I love to preach, but I couldn't get up on the stage. Even the worship team had to stop and sit down because they couldn't be heard with all of the microphones and sound systems and everything else that we had. The worship team couldn't be heard over the shouting and the screaming and the worship and the hallelujahs and the sobbing and the crying of the Spirit of God pouring out upon his people. And we left that Sunday service looking at each other saying, what on earth just happened? And then we met on the Tuesday evening for Bible study and the same thing happened at the Bible study. We met again on the following Sunday and guess what happened? As soon as we walked in, people in the corridor leading up to the main hall, they were falling down in the corridor and worshiping God. They couldn't even get to the main hall because the presence of God had filled the building so strongly they were on their faces worshipping and weeping. That whole week, people complained that I can't get any sleep. Not because of the excitement, but because of the presence of God. The presence of God was so strong, literally their brains wouldn't switch off and allow them to sleep. So they were staying awake almost all night, every night, just worshipping and praying and praising because the presence of God was so strong and intense in that place. And this didn't go on for a couple of weeks. This went on for months. 
And at the end of about four or five months, we were all completely exhausted. Because the power of God was so strong. The worship team couldn't sing. I could hardly ever preach. The presence of God was so strong. And what was funny is, you know, during that time, there were those people who said, yeah, we're with you, Paul. We want revival. But when revival broke out, they left the church. Because they said it's way too emotional. We weren't expecting this. We, ju we just thought it'd be like almost like a normal church service, but with a bit more energy. Oh, no, no. When God's presence shows up, when the fire of heaven falls, it shakes you and rocks you to your inner core. Every little secret sin you've ever thought about, you've ever considered, every little thing you've ever hidden, all of it becomes exposed before you like a big magnifying glass. And God magnifies it and magnifies it and magnifies it and makes you feel incredibly uncomfortable. So you do one of two things. You either flee from the building or you get down into the dirt, sobbing your heart out, repenting to God. When God's presence shows up and revival occurs, the people of God either run from him or they turn back to him with all of their heart. Now, as a church, we've seen revival a few times. That was the most intense. That was the most intense time, those four or five months right there. And uh, I can honestly say I've never experienced anything like it anywhere else. And I've been to lots of big mega churches and big con Christian concerts and all that. All of that pales into insignificance with the true presence of God. When the real presence of God shows up, often we don't know what to do with it because it's so profound, it's so powerful, it's so strong. Our flesh trembles on our bones and all we can do is lie in the dust, sobbing and weeping. And I pray that that will happen here. I'm praying that God's spirit will be poured out again because as a church, we've seen measures from time to time. We've seen a few healings and salvations and a few really great services. But the time will come when we won't be able to sing songs off of a screen anymore. So you need to start learning some songs off Pat yeah. that we'll just start worshiping and singing and crying out God's fame and praise. And, and then that presence begins to move out from the building so that people... When we were worshipping at Moreland's, people outside complained of the presence of God on the streets. A woman over in the, uh, it's Aldi or Lidl across the way, she started to come under the power of God when she was doing her shopping in there. And she didn't know what was going on. The church up the road began to feel it as well. It began to spread from us all over. People from all over the UK started to visit us as well. So they began to hear about it. It was such an amazing and such a powerful time. It's such a holy time. But all of that was birthed out of years of getting together in the morning and praying. And it, it was, as I said, it was boring and it was repetitive and it was a strain. But it was like Jacob grabbing hold of the angel of the Lord and saying, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. No matter how painful it gets, no matter how boring it gets, no matter how repetitive this gets, I'm gonna keep on keeping on until this thing happens. And as the church, we need to see revival in Gloucestershire. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. And the only way revival will ever come, there's no shortcut, by the way. There's never a shortcut to revival. Doesn't no matter how lovely your screen is behind you or what the lights are like or what the video's like or what your Facebook site is like or billboards across the city or how clever your marketing is. All of that stuff is really, I think, important and we should do it well to the very best of our ability, but none of that will ever bring about revival. Having a lively worship team will never bring about revival. You could have the best voices in the world singing on your stage and you will draw a crowd, but you will never have revival. The only thing that brings true revival is prayer, deep prayer, seeking God with all of your heart, not giving up, not being swayed by the weather, not being swayed by whether it's raining or whether it's snowing or whether it's sunshine. None of these things can bring revival, only deep and earnest, faith-filled prayer. Amen. What God did in the early church, he wants to do through us, but we have to pay the same price that the early church prayed. And that was they prayed without ceasing. That's why they saw the power of God. And that's why so many ministries today fake miracles. They fake miracles because they're not willing to pay the price of prayer. And so they have to kind of work it up in some other way. 1 Kings 17, 1 to 6 says this. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, said to King Ahab, the evil King Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. 
You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him, and he went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. I want you to notice he drank from the brook. Elijah didn't go thirsty during that time. Why? He was a man of God. He loved Jesus. He loved Yahweh. He loved the God of Israel. So God made sure that he didn't thirst. But who was thirsting during that time? It was the people of God, right? Israel. Israel were thirsting. Their cattle were thirsting. Their crops were dying. Why? Because of evil King Ahab. He decided to marry a pagan woman, Jezebel. And Jezebel brought into the land of Israel her pagan gods and goddesses, namely the Baal and the Asherah. Now, Asherah and Baal were fertility gods, and Baal was also the god of agriculture. And as they worshipped Asherah and as they worshipped agriculture, they were really worshipping these gods so that these gods would make their animals fertile, the land fertile, everything would grow. There'd be no barrenness in the land. That's why they worshipped these pagan demon gods. And the Israelites were swayed, they were seduced into this false worship of these false gods. And because of this, God spoke to Elijah and God shut up the heavens. Now in the UK, I'm sure if sometimes you're like me, we're praying for God to shut up the heavens. It's Lord, it's Lord, Lord it rains all day, every day in the UK, even during the summer sometimes. It, it gets to kind of like June or July and we're like, Lord, just please, let's have a bit of sun sometimes. Because sometimes our summers are, are terrible in this country. Last year it was amazing, but often we're praying for a lack of rain. We want more sun. But in a place like Israel, where they need the former and the latter rains to survive, rain is so precious to them. And should God prevent either of those two rains, or worse still, both of them, for any period of time, lots of people are going to die. And in Israel at that time, God shut up the heavens and we're told in the Bible for three and a half years. Can you imagine the, the pipe? Have you ever been to Israel? It's kind of North, North Africa way. Piping hot. It's really hot. It's hotter than, you know, I've been there in the summer. It's hotter than any summer we've ever had in England. It's absolutely insanely, insanely hot. And the sun is just beating down on them for three and a half years. And the ground is it's turning as hard as cement and the ground is cracking and nothing is growing and it's all dry and everything's dead and the cattle are moaning because there's no food for them to eat and there's no food for the, for the cattle. There's no milk. There's no meat. The cattle are dying. And with that, the, the, the Jewish people, they're dying. They've got no water. They've got no food. They've got no harvest. They've got no crops. And still, instead of repenting and turning back to Yahweh, they keep on worshipping this, this, this false goddess, Asherah, and this false god, Baal. Oh, mighty Baal, give us, give us produce. Oh, mighty Baal, help us, save us. And of course, these demon gods aren't listening because they have zero power. So you might ask, well, why did God shut up the heavens? And the reason for this is because of the covenant that God had made with Israel. When God came down upon Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb, he entered into a marriage contract with Israel. Israel became the wife of Yahweh, and Yahweh was Israel's husband. And so Yahweh created a marriage contract with the people of Israel. And this is what we often call the Mosaic Law or the Mosaic Covenant. And contained within this covenant are blessings and cursings. Blessings for obedience to God's commands and cursings if they disobey God's commands. And let's have a look at a couple of cursings, shall we? One is Leviticus 26, verses 18 to 20. And God says this to Israel, if after all of this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. 
Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of your land yield their fruit. In Deuteronomy 28, 23 to 24, God continues with the curse. The sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath your feet iron. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and into powder, and it will come down from the skies until you are completely destroyed. Here God warns Israel that if they disobey his law, if they break a marriage contract with their God, that after a while, God doesn't do this straight away, but after a while, after a grace period in which they can repent, God will then begin to enter into judgment and discipline with his wife. And what he does, he raises up a man called Elijah. And Elijah prays, and the heavens are shut up in accordance with covenant. You see, Elijah isn't just praying randomly. God just shut up the heavens, and God's like, oh, that's a good idea, Elijah, let's do that. I don't know. God has already decreed that if they disobey me, then I will fulfill my covenant, and I will shut up the heavens. I'll make them hard so no rain falls. I'll make the, the ground hard so nothing can grow. And so this is why Elijah does what he does and he prays what he prays. And now Elijah, because his heart, I'm sure his heart is like yours and like mine, we long for the people of this nation to be saved. We long for the church in this country to get its act together and return to the Bible. And to actually start teaching what the word of God literally says. And that these ministers stop allegorizing it all away. And making Jesus this 21st century, westernized, blonde-haired, blue-eyed guru that resembles the biblical Jesus in no way, shape, or form. I don't know about you, I want to worship the real Christ. I want to worship the real Yahweh. I'm not interested in some man's opinion in the pulpit, and you should never be interested in my opinion either. I'm just a bloke. But hopefully I'm a bloke that reads the Word of God and interprets it correctly. And if any way that I don't, come and talk to me about it. Come and pull me up on it. Say, Paul, it doesn't say that. I'll be like, oh, I'll be the first one to repent. Because this church is about truth. And sometimes truth is very encouraging and it's edifying. Sometimes truth is hard. And it's kind of, we don't like it. But the truth sets us free. Can I hear an amen to that? All right. 1 Kings 18, 36 to 39. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel or Jacob. Who's he talking to there? The God of Israel, the God of covenant. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. It's the God of covenant. God of covenant, I call upon you. Why is he saying this? Because this whole thing is about God's relationship with the wife of Jehovah, Israel. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all of these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice and burned up the wood and burned up the stones and burned up the soil and it also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. You see, Baal being a demon god of agriculture, he was also known as the god of weather, the god of weather. And when you look back at ancient idols and statues of Baal, sometimes he stood there like a, he's like he's holding a harpoon. But instead of throwing a harpoon, he's holding on to a bolt of lightning. So if any god should be able to send rain, it's Baal. If any god should be able to send fire down from the heavens, i.e. lightning, any god should be able to cast lightning down from the heavens onto a sacrifice. Who is it? Baal. So Elijah challenges their demon God at his own game. Okay, if you are the God of agriculture, if you are the God of weather, if you can bring rain and if you can send lightning, then do it. But at my word, these heavens won't pour forth rain for three and a half years. And Baal could do nothing about it because Yahweh is in control, not some demon God. 
And that's just as true for our country today. I don't care what religion you follow, what path you follow, there is only one way. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the one that's totally sovereign, nobody else. There is no demon power out there that should make you tremble as a born-again Christian because greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Amen? Amen. And I'm looking at a lot of Elijahs and Elijahesses in this place today. You've got the Spirit of God in you, the power of God on you, and you have been called to change the nation. First of all, change your neighborhood, change your workplace, change your city, change your county. We have been called to change society. And if we're not changing society as the church, if we're not being salt and light, then we are not fulfilling the commission that our Lord and Savior and Rabbi has given to us. We must be changing society with salt and with light. And good works are fine. Being a good person is fine. But I ain't going to change nothing. You can be the nicest person in the world. You can give all of your property and all of your goods away and, and, and share encouraging messages. And you can do all of this and it will not change a single sausage. The only thing that changes society is the gospel message. Amen. And by gospel message, I don't mean good news about anything. I mean the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross physically. He was buried physically in the tomb of Joseph of Marathea. He was resurrected physically, bodily, in a resurrected body on the third day. He appeared alive to more than 500 eyewitnesses. And then he ascended back to heaven, sprinkling his blood before the throne of God bringing justification for you and me, for anyone out there who will repent and fully trust in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. When we truly repent, when we get down into the dust and into the ashes and we sob and we weep and we grieve over our sin and we say, God, I'm not the Lord. You are the Lord. What am I? I'm just a worm in your sight. What am I? The best I can be, Lord, is your servant. And that's what I want to be. When we reach that point of deep humiliation, deep repentance and trust in Jesus Christ, then we can be saved and born again spirit filled then we begin to change the nation I often wonder why God chose Elijah and not all the other Israelites well it's simply this he had character he had character he loved Yahweh whilst everybody else was chasing after these demon gods he said no I'm not me I'm gonna keep I'm gonna stay faithful and you see Elijah he didn't have a church in those days he didn't have a church he could go to get encouragement from he didn't have a pastor looking after him he was on his own he was solo he was by himself. He couldn't turn on the television and watch God Channel for encouragement. He couldn't turn on UCB radio and listen to some God songs. Didn't have any of that. He didn't have a Bible that he could carry around with him and read. He had to memorize whatever he had learned. He had no encouragement from anyone. All he had was his prayer life with God. That's why he was so strong. Because so I think sometimes as Christians, we can substitute prayer for all of these other things because prayer wars against our flesh. Whereas these other things are fine. Sitting down, nice cup of tea, biscuit, have a little dunk, put on the God channel, no problem. Yeah, easy, right? Watch a, watch a God program, brilliant. Put on some God music in the car as you're driving, no problem, yeah? Easy, easy stuff. Prayer, whoa, your flesh doesn't want that. That's not very entertaining, that's tough. Reading the Bible, whoa, your, your flesh doesn't want that. But you see, that's why... There are so many malnourished Christians in this country because they're reading their little word of the day and they've got their God books and their God programs and their God music. And none of these things are wrong, but they can be a distraction from the true thing, which is relationship with God. Prayer. And it all boils down to prayer. Pretty much every single one of my sermons, right, is about prayer. It always comes back to prayer. What's your relationship like with God? How much are you talking to him? How much are you thinking about him? When you read the word and study the word, are you thinking and praying, Lord, how can I implement this in my life? It's prayer, 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 revival, prayer. All comes from prayer. All comes from prayer. Prayer is the foundation of all things. And so Elijah challenges this demon god and these demon goddesses and nothing happens. And the prophets of Baal, 450 in number, they're shouting and they're screaming and they're cutting themselves and they're letting blood and... They're kind of doing their own human sacrifice on themselves. Nothing is happening. And Elijah begins to mock them. Maybe your God's asleep. Shout louder. Come on. Maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he's gone away on his travels, on his journeys. And he's mocking them. And he's saying, look, your God is nothing. And all of Israel's watching this. And then Elijah steps forward and just prays a very simple prayer. And boom, a flash of lightning comes down. 
It consumes the sacrifice. It consumes the stone. It consumes and licks up all the water. Such the power of God came down. And the people cry out, the Lord, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And what's Elijah's name? Elijah. In Hebrew is Eli, Yahu. Eli, Yahu. Eli means God, Elohim. And Yahu is, is a shortened version of Yahweh, the Lord. When they cry out, the Lord, he is God, they're going, Elijah, Elijah. Elijah's name is the Lord, he is God. How awesome is that? That his very name from his birth, God gave him that birthright. God gave him that mission. God gave him that purpose right from the moment he came out. How awesome is that? The Lord, he is God. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is because we need to look at these principles of Elijah, implement them in our life, because we're going to see revival come. Then we need to start challenging a few demon forces out there. Amen. And we do that through prayer. We do that through truth. We do that through challenging it. And we're going to watch these things fall in Jesus' name. 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. We're going to finish with this. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. No, there isn't. It's not a cloud in the sky. It's not a cloud in the sky. So how can Elijah say this? Well, number one, he's a prophet. He's speaking from God. But number two, it's because the people have now repented. And when the people of God truly repent, guess what is restored to them? blessing when there's deep repentance in the hearts of believers that's when you see the blessing of God flow and often as Christians the reason we struggle in our spiritual walk is because there's unconfessed sin in our life and we don't like to admit that and that kind of hurts our conscience and we're like oh, it's not so bad well it is if you're feeling dry if you're feeling dry as a believer there's only one reason for it sin Sin. Sin is what dries you up. Sin is what makes you feel depressed. Sin is what makes it feel like God is a million miles from you. Sin is what robs you of your joy and your peace. Sin is what robs you of that grace of God in your life. I mean, His, His presence is always there. His grace is always there. The joy and the life and the love is always available. But sin is like this wall that we put up and prevent God from getting close. Adam and Eve did it. And what did they do immediately? They went and hid behind the bushes. They put up a wall, a barrier between themselves and God. As soon as we repent of sin and we get serious, the old revivalists used to say, take a, a notepad and a pencil and sit down one afternoon and go through all the sins you've ever committed. Write it down and confess each one. Bum, 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 bum. Keep confessing it. Keep confessing it. Get rid of it in your life until you feel like there's nothing else you can confess. Then ask for the presence of God to fall. And they said revival would follow that and Elijah said to Ahab go eat and drink there's a sound of heavy rain so Ahab went off to eat and drink but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel he bent down to the ground put his face between his knees and he said to his servant go and look toward the sea and he went and looked and said there's nothing there but se seven times Elijah said go back go back go back the seventh time the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising up from the sea so Elijah said right go and tell Ahab Hitch up your chariot. Go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain started falling. And Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah. And tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. A reason Elijah could pray with such confidence is because he knew that God is a covenant-keeping God. That when God says he will bless for obedience and he will curse for disobedience, he's not messing around. God will do exactly what he says he will do. And now they've repented. The rain can be restored. And so Elijah prays, Lord, send the rain, send the rain, send the rain. Sends his servant back over and over and over again. Go and have another look. Go and have another look. I know the blessing's coming. Go and have another look. Go and have another look. And then eventually, there's a cloud. How big is it? It's about that big. Really, really tiny. Okay. Tell Ahab to get a move on because big storms are coming. And I can imagine the servant looking out at that little cloud going like, oh, that, that's that big. But it doesn't matter. Every great outpouring of God has small beginnings, amen? amen? Maybe just a couple of people meeting in the garage every day. 
It might be a couple of old ladies on the island of Lewis praying for revival. It might just be a collier in South Wales praying for revival. It might just be this very small beginning, this insignificant beginning, this person you overlook, this group that doesn't really have much impact, but they keep on keeping on. They keep looking, they keep praying, they, they get their face down in the dust, they get their head between their knees and they pray and they pray and they pray until, until there is that small cloud. Then revival's coming. I hear an amen to that. God always answers prayer according to covenant. This is why as Christians, sometimes when we pray, it seems like God doesn't answer our prayers. It's because we are not praying covenantally. We are not praying covenantally. What do I mean by this? I've met many believers over the years who have prayed to God and asked God for a husband or for a wife. And God hasn't provided a husband or a wife. And they're like, God, why haven't you given me a husband or wife? I've been praying all of these years for a husband or for a wife. And I don't have a husband or a wife. Why are you such a meanie? Why aren't you answering my prayers? I prayed and I fasted. You're not giving me a husband or a wife. And I've asked you for a husband and a wife. And God responds, where have I ever said I'm going to give you a husband and wife if you pray for it? Show me one scripture in the new covenant. Anywhere where God says, if you pray, I'll give you a husband and a wife. It's not there. The Bible says, if you burn, acquire a wife. Go and find one. Go on a dating website. Go out on a few dates. Go and meet a few people. Get out there. Go and pursue. It's like me staying at home saying, Lord, do my Asda shop for me. God, do my Asda shop. God, bring that food to my door. This is what I want. I want bags and bacon and sausages and beans and bread and, Lord, some milk. I don't want the, the semis giving me like the full fat stuff. Lord, bring me that. Lord, and I wake up in the morning and look up. It's not there. Lord, why isn't it there? I've been praying. Bring my Asda shop to me. If it's not Asda, do little Aldi. I'm not fussy. Bring it to me, Lord. It's weird. We think that God is our servant. God, I want this. You do it. Lord, I want a Tesla. Give me a Tesla. I want a swimming pool to go with it, Lord. God, give me a job. I need a job, Lord. I want a job. Why aren't you getting me a job, Lord? Go and write your CV and start putting it out there. Go start knocking on a few businesses' doors. Get signed up with a job agency. Nowhere in the new covenant does God promise that if we pray and ask him for a husband or a wife or a job or a new car or him to do our shopping. Nowhere does God promise to do any of this stuff for us. And that's why in the church today, so many Christians have such weak faith. It's because they've tried prayer and it didn't work. And it's because they weren't praying covenantally. Elijah was a man who prayed and knew how to pray. He prayed according to the covenant of God. He knew the law of Moses and he prayed in accordance with what's written in the promise. We're not under the law of Moses as Christians. We're under the new covenant, the covenant of Christ's blood. And that starts with the book of Acts and goes all the way through to the book of Revelation. And if you want to pray, you pray in accordance with what is written from Acts through to Revelation. If you can find a promise in there, you pray and you stand upon that promise until God fulfills it because he has to. It's covenant. The covenant in Christ's blood. But stuff like material stuff, God, give me more money, give me a husband, give me a wife, give me a faster car, give, do this for me. God isn't our servant, and that's so dangerous. That's a dangerous idea in the church today. We start thinking that God has to do what I say when I pray. Oh, no, 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 no. Do you realize how powerful he is and how weak we are? He and our servant, trust me, we are his servants and even that is a big claim even that is a big claim you know in the law of Moses there's that commandment isn't there you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God and often we think it's blasphemy and it certainly is but it means more than that it means do not bear God's name in vain do not bear God's name in vain in other words if you're going around telling people hey I'm a Christian you're bearing God's name but then you're not living like a Christian that's blasphemy 
If you're saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, but at work you're lying either to your boss or for your boss, you are bearing his name in vain. If you're stealing, you're bearing his name in vain. If you're losing your temper and abusing your wife, abusing your children, abusing your friends, whatever you're doing, you are bearing his name in vain. As a follower of Jesus, you have to live and walk as Jesus lived and walked. We mustn't bear his name in vain. And when we walk as Jesus walked, we can ask the Father for anything and he will do it for us. Anything according to covenant. And today we see a church, especially in the United Kingdom, that is barren, that is dry, that in many places is dead. And some of these churches are big. They've got hundreds of people in, thousands of people in sometimes, but they're spiritually dead. They're communal groups that get together and have a sprinkling of Jesus. But nothing too challenging. We'll get together and just talk about God's love and God's grace. And God's love and God's grace. And a bit more grace. A bit more love. We won't challenge anybody. We won't confront anything. We just talk about grace. And love. And it's got nothing to do with biblical Christianity at all. Nothing to do with biblical Christianity at all. But when the people of God return to God and they, they repent, then God will send the Spirit again. Then Jesus will say, I'm no longer standing on the outside of the church knocking, saying, let me in. Christ will be in. He'll be in us. He'll come and fellowship with us. And then when we pray, revival will break out and it will spread, not just from here, but all over the nation, all over the world. I hear an amen to that. Amen. The rain is coming. It's only a prayer away.